I am Jeff Foxworthy, and welcome to Gamekeeper Podcast. If you want to learn more about farming for wildlife and habitat management, then buddy, you are in the right place. Join the Gamekeeper crew direct from Mossy Oak Land Enhancement Studio as they discuss the latest wildlife and habitat management practices, news, and of course, hunting. There's no telling what you'll learn, but I'm going to tell you, I bet it's interesting. Enjoy. We're live in three, two, one. All right, everybody, here we go. Finally got this one started. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, uh, welcome to West Point, Mississippi. First, let me get that out of the way. Uh, home of Mossy Oak and the Gamekeeper Studio. Here we are. Uh, it is, it, and in all its glory, it's just such a cool little place to spend a couple hours every week. It is. Busy it, around here today. It, it, it is. And, like a uh, beehive. Yeah, and Sam cooked for us. Yeah. But, and I do have one request, if I could, make with... Sam and the cookie. Can we get him a hairnet? Oh, yeah, that's no problem. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's a good idea. I, I, I think we Did you could. find something yeah, suspicious time. in your Cajun pasta today? <laughs> yeah, it was just a little... It was huh. still good, though. Huh? <laughs> it was delicious. Did you power through it? Yes, yeah, yeah. so if I could buy that off of uh, the butchery website pre-made, I would be all about it. Hey, that's a good idea. Yeah. What was it called? Uh, I think it was a Cajun uh, duck that's... sausage pasta, basically. So you had uh, hickory bacon, uh, smoked duck sausage, uh, crawfish, Fettuccine and uh, Creole cream sauce, so it's quite delicious. It, it was, you it made was that good. sound like you're a wait. You've been waiting tables for ten years. Well, you know the way you describe food, it, it, it I mean, it's kind of tantalizing. Yeah, so. it was good. It was your, good. So today is tomorrow. Actually, is Cinco de Mayo. Oh man. So we need to say hello to our, our Mexican friends. Uh, so yeah, yeah, they're right. down there listening to us. And so uh, happy Cinco de Mayo. And then uh, <laughs> Olivia is over here. Would you sell, say hello to our French listeners, please? You, uh, bonjour. Boom. Boom. That's right. She, she figured that out. Yeah, I good. knew Dudley would have already forgotten that. <laughs> <Yeah>. so, <laughs> I think we sure. said we. <laughs> yeah. So we've got, this is going to be a really fun podcast. We've got Dr. Mark McConnell from Mississippi State. And we've got Olivia Lappin. She's been here a couple of times. She is a grad student if I'm getting that right and she's studying quail she's super smart and she's a biologist and so we, we've got her we here got to some brain questions. power in here today yeah we do like and it. if you will remember we met Mark years ago at a, at a hunt and he had a French poodle. The poodle. And I our, forgot about that. That was the most awesome dog I've ever seen. Both, yeah. the, both of our dogs fell in love yeah, they with did. that dog. I it, did too. It was like, the way I describe it, it was like they were farm boys from Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> and she was a French model. Yeah. <laughs> they just stood there and stared up on the hill. <laughs> <laughs> they did. They sure did. It, it, she was, was, so, she was so, a good-looking so, dog in her day, that's for sure. She's yeah. But even better than that, though, she was a very, or is a very good retriever. Yeah, very good. I was very, very fortunate to well, have Well, you such know, a good in, dog. Uh, in France, they're known as puddle dogs. And that is Water dogs. that is our own Bill Gibson sitting in with us. We're going to be talking about quail and dogs, so it's perfect for half him. But obviously, what were you saying about a puddle dog? That's what, uh, in France, they're known as puddle dogs. The poodles? Yeah. So it's not a poodle, it's a puddle. A puddle. Puddle well, dog. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, the German word P-U-D-L is where it originated, poodle uh, or puddle dog. It's a yeah. splash in the water dog. So they were originally bred to not only just retrieve down waterfowl, but, you know, people re- use them for a lot of different things in, in Europe. So they were very common. They came to the U.S. and, and, and things kind of went astray. And uh, and then a lot of people in the U.S. are actually trying to breed them back to hunting dogs. So yeah, a, quite a movement for it in the last ten years. Hmm. Well, your dog—it was a big dog. Yeah, she uh, for a poodle. <clears throat> sure. Yeah, a lot of people are. You know, there's a bunch of different sizes. She's a standard. She's probably on the lower end on the standards. Her litter mates were a little bit bigger than her, but uh, her hair makes her look a lot bigger when she's all. Yeah, curly. she was poofy. Fruit, fruit. Yeah, she was. She had her hair done. She, that's she's for sure. only in her prime during hunting season. I could barely keep her at thirty six pounds because mm. uh, she was. She is so. Is she maroon? Or red? She was technically called a red, but yeah. it's more of an apricotish red looking. Yeah, at. yeah, she's a beautiful uh, dog. I do remember that. She's eleven years old now. Still, still really? going. Goose is still asking about her. <laughs> <laughs> Where's she at? We could have made here. We could have made a lot of like money off that. Like we sure could have. Do you He's think, kind of purple looking black anyway. <laughs> Do you think every time Goose loads up in the truck to go hunting, he's thinking this is going to be the She's going to be there. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It probably is. So you traveled off to Georgia and did some work at the University of Georgia, and now you're back at Mississippi State. Yeah, I left in 2015. It was a. a Wildlife Extension professor, much like y'all's friend Bronson Strickland, mm-hmm. um, I had his essentially his job description over at UGA. Did that for three years, and then um, the quail research position here 
had been vacant for a few years and they were building an, an endowment to try to get a big quail program going and uh, came back and I started back here in January of 19 and just about, I don't know what year we're in, but three or so years into it. Yeah. You know. Wow. That's, that's pretty amazing. Mr. State's it's been kinda, 11 years since we've seen yeah, the call. Yeah, that has been a while. <laughs> so, and it, well, Copper's, he's getting up there. He's he getting gray, up there. Yeah. He is great. He is. That's true. Before we dive down into this, I, there's something I got to ask about that I heard. And uh, Richie, are you around? So, I'm, I'm told <laughs> you that you're coaching a t-ball team. Is that would that be correct? Am I? Yeah, I, I yeah, guess that's correct. Right. See, answering the horns today. Yes, that would be correct. <laughs> okay, so Richie is a big sports fan. And anytime you walk into Richie's office, you're liable to hear the ESPN zap going off or something like that. But Richie, I just want to ask: Is it true that one of your players this past week was caught relieving himself on third base? That wasn't my child. Was it? <laughs> that actually was my child. <laughs> <laughs> I thought my kids might have been out there with you for a minute. <laughs> yeah, so like the first day of practice there, you know, I realized that, you know, I turn around there and uh, my son's standing on third base and he's just letting it letting go. Letting it rip. <laughs> and he, yeah. <laughs> Since he's realized he can do that, it's we have to watch him like a hawk because he'll just go anywhere. So I've got to. Got to toe all the time. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I wish it was... I wish it was allowable for everybody to do that. It's, just so, <laughs> it's so convenient. Yeah, you don't think you can get away with it, buddy. Oh, me. Well, when I heard that, I said, that could not have been a young Davenport, but I guess I was wrong. Oh, man. It'll happen. Well, um, keep us posted. I, I was going to say, uh, Mark was at the Turkey Summit, the MDWF and P, you know, the oh, Mississippi yeah. Turkey Summit, and uh, was answering a lot of difficult questions. Uh, it, uh, he and one of his colleagues were more or less in the hot seat for the whole, <laughs> the whole time. The firing squad and, uh, was I was like, man, home. this is a sharp guy. And then uh, about a month later, I saw him at church and introduced myself. So, uh, did you know? Small, you wor the, small you, world, very you, small world. Aren't you, are you still? Do you still hold your warden position at church? I'm still the warden at nice, church. Nice, nice, yeah. good job. Proud of you, that's, that's exciting. And most people don't know what you know. Warden doesn't mean like I police the church. Oh, he hadn't checked your license. <laughs> just, if there's a leaky toilet or something, I get to fix it. That's, that's what my job is. <laughs> well, that's more than you do around here. Hey, you're you're serving. Serving. That's good. Yeah, come on. All right. So, uh, well, let, let's get moving on. But, but uh, one last piece of business before we get moving on. Mac, is there a commercial for this week? There is. I mean, since we're talking about Upland Birds and the Bob Whites, I figured no better sponsor of this week's episode is Browning Firearms. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. Quality stuff. Yeah. Well, so, uh, look, guys, I'll go ahead. The Browning Firearms, we we No we, doubt about it. Long-time partners, long-time friends of ours are great equipment. Th there's one thing I was going to say, though. I somehow, Mr. Bill, you can probably jump in here, too, but... I managed to wait until I was in my mid fifties before I got my first over and under, and I regret that. Now I wish I had gotten one a lot sooner in life because they're they're so much easier to shoot. They're 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 a lot of fun to shoot, and I think they're safer. If I had a young kid, Lanny, if I was you, and I had two heathens that I was raising, like I, you I got, I can relate to that. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> but I think I'd rather when I got when it got time to turn them loose on the dove field. I think I'd rather them have an over and under. And can you explain your your, your logic there? Just wondering. Well, they can break it open, mm -hmm. and so they can stand there with the gun open when it's not going to fire while they're waiting on something to happen, and yeah. uh, you know, and it's too you know, I I just think it teaches you to be a better shot. Hmm. And I could be wrong there, Mark. I saw you kind of raise your hand like I you agreed. Could but. not agree more. Um, I, I I didn't wait till I, I got one at twenty seven or twenty eight because all I ever wanted. I, I just had these memories of my grandfather, my great uncle, when he would shoot a duck and he'd crack open that that uh, that over and under and those the, that Shells smoke coming out. out. Yeah. And I had this image burned in my head. I'm like, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen. And I was like, I got to get one of these. So when I graduated with my dissertation, my parents bought me one. And uh, I asked uh, Jim Miller, who some of y'all may remember, he just passed away a few months ago, but just just a huge you know uh, personality and I had a great career in the wildlife profession. I called Jim and said, what should I get? Because I didn't know and end up buying one and it, it, cleaning so much easier. There's no moving parts. It's just the firing pin and two barrels, really, and everything else. So it's not like you got to take the the action out and everything. And so, like uh, my son, he has a. It's not a double gun, but he's got a crack barrel single shot 410 that he hunts with. Yeah. Same principle, right? He opens it, it's open. I know he can't fire it. 
and I Barney Fife him. You know, I carry one bullet with me at a time, and then when he's when he's ready to shoot, Slide I hand it to him. Time. And uh, I don't know if your listeners know the Barney Fife reference. <laughs> oh yeah, of course. They do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, no, Bobby, I could not agree more. I think it's. I wish I'd have had one when I first started. Yeah, uh, now, I, I really I'm serious about that. Well, I'll tell Hayden and Logan on their birthday that then you can come see Uncle Bobby. Yeah, well, <laughs> be careful what you tell them. Yeah. But uh, but so Brownie's got a bunch of over and unders. The that there's this the the Satori in a bunch of different grades. Yeah, yes, it is. I would venture to say the Satori is probably taking more quail in the. It's got to be the last most tower for many years than overnight. any any other fouling piece. Great gun. I, I, so I just wanted to say that and point that out because I wish somebody had grabbed me when I was in my mid twenties. I didn't do a dessert or whatever ago. you did, but, but that was a lot. But they were making satoris back then. Oh, they were. They yeah, were. I can good. you know when I worked at the Adams, John Browning others you know, stomping them out. We used to sell them. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so y'all go to browningfirearms.com and uh, and check those out. So all right, so let's circle back. We got uh, Mr. Bill Gibson. Dudley, you're a quail aficionado yourself. We've been on some hunts, and I know you you, you, you enjoy that. So, look, let's just start and kind of go down down memory lane first and not spend much time here. But we we all have heard stories about what the quail used to be. Mr. Mr. Gibson, you could probably attest to it. You were telling some stories a little bit earlier. But, boy, it's, it's a shame that it's not like that anymore. Yeah, ter- uh, quail have gone through uh, quite the history. I think you were saying earlier it's the— you know, American conservation story where, mm-hmm. you know, you hear, I was saying, you know, some of the old timers, you know, tell, oh, there's tons of quail in my day. And, and it, it's brutal when you're a young quail biologist to try to to be so passionate about this bird, but I never got to experience what people call the head. Yeah, I kind of wonder if that's job security. Or not job <laughs> well, security, yeah. you know, people ask me, like, how do I stay uh, motivated? I, yeah. it, it's really easy because I, I, I see what works on properties and what doesn't work. And when you, when you, when you make it happen, you know, it's, it's fun to watch. So the, I'm, I mean, I never lose hope on on quail, but, you know, you have to qualify what your goals are. But, yeah, so historically, I don't know how far you want me to go back, Bobby, but, you know, uh, European settlement, kind of quail everywhere, and, you know, small-scale agriculture, fallowing fields, hedgerows, delineating property lines, no her- no herbicide or at least no broad-scale herbicide. We were clearing forests slowly, and you had all that, you know, kind of growth coming mm-hmm. in. Just a lot of great things that were good about, you know, that were made, that quail liked. And quail used to be really associated with agriculture. They were kind of a byproduct of it. And then as the population grew and we became more intensive in farming, more industrialized, a lot of things happened. We brought over Bermuda grass. We brought over fescue. We brought over bahia. We uh, we we started farming really intensively, fence row to fence row is what right. USDA told us to do back then. And, 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 and we had to maximize every acre. Then we started managing pine plantations the way we do now, which are not really conducive and you put all that stuff together, and the landscape, over time, just really started becoming really bad for Bob White. And um, and by the time people noticed, you know, the mo- the wheels were in motion. It was hard to stop, and we started to slow it down. And there was a pa- 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 publication from 1991 by Lenny Brennan, who's a, a professor of uh, quail research at uh, Texas A and M. He kind of wrote this paper in 1991. Is it 91? Yeah. Yeah. And. We knew the decline, but that kind of put it on the map. Nationally. Everybody's right. like, oh, my goodness, we've let it go this far. And we've been working ever since to uh, keep quail around, try to increase their populations. And uh, there's a lot of people doing it. There's a lot of things you can do. And are the days of 10 coveys in a, in a morning or in most of the landscape? Yeah, those are days are probably, are probably gone, except mm-hmm. in a few places in the world. Like there's on a wet year in Texas, man, you the stuff you, you were talking yeah. about, you don't need a dog, you know. Yeah. Uh, you go to the Red Hills, some of those places down in southern Georgia, northern Florida. That's that's doable a lot of times. But for the rest of of the range, uh, those days are probably gone. But that doesn't mean you can't go out and find three or four coveys in a day. And I know places on public land where you can find three or four coveys a day if you got a good bird dog. So the uh, we're not done with quail yet. Their their his, the, their future is is not is not set yet. We've got a lot of potential, I think. Hey, this is Toxie Hayes with Mossy Oak. You know, hunting and fishing, gamekeeping, and taking care of the land with my family is my life. And I'll be honest with you, the one app that I'm on every day and use more than anything is Onyx. It literally has changed my life. 
from property ownership to roads, everything to do with understanding the land better. I even use it to plot acreages all the time. Every function I could dream of, use coupon code Mossy Oak to save 20% on your next Onyx subscription. Trust me, you'll be so glad you did. You know, it's, it's, we talk about quail a lot, and, and you know, the, the only hunting we get to do are these liberated birds. And it's all, you know, it's different, but it still kind of carries those same traditions that, that we want to see stay alive. But if a guy's a, is, a, a, is a deer hunter and he's, he's in a club or a leash and they've got 800 acres, there are things that he can do um, to, to help those wild quail. Not necessarily, and I'll be the first to say, not necessarily to hunt them, but just to have them, I think it's so important that, that we try to help them wherever they are. Oh, sure. But could you kind of go into some of the things that a guy might could do or you were Olivia? Yeah, absolutely. And let me just say, and because I was flipping through y'all's magazine earlier and y'all had the article in there on, on the co-ops, you know, people think of the co-op model as a deer model. The co-op model can apply to turkeys, quail, anything, right? Which you, if a, I get a lot of calls from landowner, I've got 40 acres, is it even worth my time? Absolutely, it's worth your time. Just talk to your neighbors too and get them all to do it. Mm-hmm. So in terms of what you can do to manage for quail, they're the same tools we do to manage for, for, for deer and turkeys and other things, just at a little bit, little bit different frequency. Like in the South, you know, in ag, row crops used to, a long time ago, used to be kind of a, you know, weedy soybean. Soybeans mm-hmm. used to be considered the best thing you can do for quail. Bill, you remember, you know, that was a thing. Well, we don't let much else grow in a soybean field anymore, so yeah. there's not a whole lot for a, for a brood of bobwhite chicks to, to forage. But we have lots of opportunities through USDA to take some of that land out of production and usually your less profitable land and kind of put some quail cover on the ground in ag landscapes. Uh, in timber, in pine timber, which we got a lot in the south, you know, we, 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 stopped, we stopped burning a long time ago, mm-hmm. right? We used, burning used to be a standard thing. You know, quail season over, you lit the woods on fire. And quail, are the, they're called the fire bird. They, they need frequent fire. So we stopped burning. That had a lot to do with it. Uh, the timber industry, you know, ebbs and flows a little bit, so we don't thin as many trees probably should. A lot of our pine timber is just too dense. Uh, so thinning trees, lighting fires. If you got old field areas, uh, as long as you don't have exotic grasses on it, throwing a disc down there once a year in the fall can create some, is the cheapest way to create bobwhite habitat I've ever seen. You call it fall disking. Sometime between, I tell people, after the first frost and between green up, just run a disc. Don't disc it like you're going to plant corn on it. Just run it over a couple times, turn up that soil, stimulate those seeds, Bam, you get partridge pea, ragweed, all kinds of good quail foods for, for creates brood habitat in the summer, creates a seed bank in the fall. Um, so fire, thinning, disking, herbicide has a role too, but essentially the goal with quail in the forested systems is to get sunlight on the ground. And that's what we need for deer and turkeys too. And we do that through thinning and prescribed fire. Mm-hmm. In the ag fields, it's just adding some cover for them. In the kind of hay field area, it's just a matter of churning up the soil and stimulating plants that quail can actually utilize. But those are the same tools we do for everything. It's the best one. sound yeah. in the world. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm just, I'm, this one might be coming from left field because I'm just now starting to pay attention to these uh, transitions between, um, between really timber and open areas and how harsh that is. And I think y'all refer to it as edge feathering or something like that. Does that have a real benefit for quail? Oh, man, that's a good question. So for edge feathering, just to, if people aren't, overly familiar with it essentially it's softening an edge let's mm-hmm. say you got an ag field or a pasture next to a pine forest right that's pretty hard it's pretty drastic change, drastic change, change sure. so what we do is we come in and you knock some trees down let them fall or you can remove them a lot of people just let them fall and essentially you're just letting them fall into the forested side to get some more sunlight in the ground and soften up that transition so you've got a vegetated community slightly vegetated into a wooded mm-hmm. community there is a little bit of research on it. I, I have a real strict rule. I try not to recommend things unless I can I can show some evidence that it, that it works. And uh, there's some research to show that it's beneficial. Uh, there hadn't been a ton of just evaluation of it because a lot of landowners don't want to do it because they think it's ugly. Yeah, uh, yeah. I can and, understand that because that, that's why it really <clears throat> sunk in so much to me because I loved, you know, in my mind for hunting, seeing that break between typically pine you know, an ag field yeah. or a pine. I'm like, oh, that's my edge right there. And you're always taught wildlife travels edges. But now that I back up and look at the landscape as a whole, oh my gosh, there's like tons of it. You know, and and granted, you would have to lose a little bit of your ag or lose a little bit of your of your of your forest. But it just seems like one of the biggest areas I, I've noticed in the past couple of years to really do some uh, real wildlife management work. 
Yeah, there quail don't need every acre. I mean, granted, if every acre you own was managed for quail, then I would, you know, my mm-hmm. job would be over. Uh, but they just need a little bit here and there. And what we try to tell people is focus on the areas you don't have. You're not you're not doing something else yeah. with, right? And and edge feathering can can be fun. Um, but uh, and then light and fires, like yeah. I said, most the the oh, biggest we thing love to burn stuff. the biggest thing limiting <laughs> quail in the southeast <laughs> is a lack of fire. Right. Um, you know, the Smokey the Bear campaign years ago, we're still recovering from that. Which um, ironically, you know, Smokey the Bear was found in New Mexico. And stuff like that. What? Huh. Yeah. Anyway, I did not Sorry. know that. A little ADD too. <laughs> right. you know, I had to put that in. Yeah, Mac, why don't you fire up the internet and find and then double check? So, yeah, please, please, um, Mac. You know, I'll just say this: that uh, the majority of our listeners aren't likely to be diehard quail enthusiasts, um, but I would say a lot of them are interested in making some quail to listen to on their property. Uh, right now, uh, turkey season is still a big deal and everybody's talking about what they can do for turkeys. So is there, are there, what are some of the practices that you can do for turkeys that are going to be equally as good for quail? I mean, is there? Yeah, there's very little space in between them at the broad scale. There are some minute things you have to do. Like for example, Bob White really, really, really needs shrub cover. Now turkeys like to nest and y'all seen found turkey nests, thick, nasty stuff. But we don't usually have to plant shrubs uh, for, for turkey habitat. It might be beneficial, but it's not a, a, a practice we focus on. Whereas with Bob White, I, I mean, my lab, my re- my group alone, I, I planted two or three thousand shrubs uh, th- this year. We, we plant them all the time to get more shrub cover. But burning, uh, man, I'm telling you, just lighting fires. Turkeys need it. Quail need it. Uh, the frequency may, you know, be, you can tweak a little bit how kind of how frequently you burn it, but. Um, at the end of the day, they're both, we call galliforms, chicken-like birds. They both nest on the ground. Neither one of them lives all that long, although Bob White have a much shorter lifespan. They, uh, so they, there's a lot of overlap in terms of what they need. Their diets vary, but have a lot more overlap, more similarities than differences. So if you're lighting fires and thinning trees and creating good herbaceous vegetation cover, turkeys are going to benefit, uh, quail are going to benefit. And for the most part, you know, deer, yeah, I've got some... I've got some properties I consult on that they've got the cheapest food plots in the world where they just light fires and create herbaceous vegetation. There's more forage. There's more, I call them deer groceries. There's more deer groceries on the ground across that forest than you'd ever get anywhere else uh, just from lighting a fire. Yeah, you know, to, to, to his point, I got a text from Toxie yesterday saying he wasn't going to be able to be here, but he's got a property in a place that I can't say where it is. Undisclosed but, location. But, but he's been burning it for a number of years for for. And mainly for turkeys, uh, he, he would tell you that. But he said, "I am hearing more and more quail." And, I mean, he was just real excited about that. So that's a it just plays to write exactly what you just su- it, it's suggested. Like, it's like the old field of dreams: if you build it, they will come; if you burn it, they will come. If there's quail in the landscape, uh, my old advisor and I used to joke they can smell the smoke and they come yeah. running. Uh-huh. You know, we uh, believe it. That's about true. that. Yeah, like, you our, got a question. Yeah, I, I, I just heard you talking about planting shrubs. Just uh, can you give us kind of an understanding what maybe specific species that you're planting? It here, well, here in the prairie, in this part of the state, we plant a lot of Chickasaw plum. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's probably my favorite. I just really like the structure of it. But uh, quail use wing sumac, uh, sumac. The sumac, you know, it can get really tall, and then it becomes less less useful. I mean, they still have produce seeds quail eat. Sumac's good uh, shrub. Some people don't call it a shrub, but some people do. But blackberry thickets, there's nothing better, in my opinion, for mm. a bobwhite population than just a bunch of blackberry thickets. That's a place for them to hide, stay away from predators, get cool in the summertime. Uh, little dogwood patches sometimes can be really good uh, wood, co- uh, wood uh, shrubby cover. Um, I don't recommend people plant eastern red cedar, uh, at least not in the prairie, uh, but some people disagree with that, but they're wrong. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know we have a, a we have a product I'm not trying to sell anything here, but we created it a number of years ago, about 10 or 12 years ago, Lanny. Yeah. <clears throat> it's called whistleback. Yeah. And we encourage guys in the summertime to, so if you've got a two acre summer food plot, plant an edge of it. And, it, and so it helps create edge, but it's full of uh, millet and milo and sunflowers and Egyptian wheat, and it forms an edge like you were talking about before. But we see, I mean, guys that pay attention and do this, we, we hear them say, God, I didn't even know I had any quail. And now I'm seeing a little covey run around, and they just get so much enjoyment out of a, hearing them, and then B, seeing them. Well, going back to what you said earlier, you know, a lot of people, we're, our goal is to restore quail to 
you know, as, as, as many as we can, really. But like you said, I think most people throughout the what we now consider the quail range, they're just happy with seeing them and hearing them. I rarely get a landowner that asks me, I want to be able to hunt quail. Uh, most of them are over 65. They just want to see them and hear them and enjoy them while they ride around. And uh, when I was in grad school years ago, I used to monitor a bunch of different properties. We were doing a quail research project, and I can't remember the gentleman's name, but he was 90 years old, and I would call him once a year to let him know we were coming out to do quail surveys, and he had flushed a covey the day before I called him uh, on his ATV. <clears throat> I don't think there were UTVs back then, but I can't remember. Anyway... And he, I call him to tell him, hey, I'm, we're going to come out. And he goes, man, I flushed a covey on this property for the first time in 40 years. This is the best day of my life. Like he, he was, I couldn't get him off the phone. <laughs> and it wasn't that he had a good rise over two locked on dogs and he shot an over and under. It was that he flushed the covey. Yeah. And it made his day. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, Bill Gibson, what, what do you remember about quail hunting that you, what do you miss about it? Just seeing them, but uh, when I was a young guy, and that was a million years ago, uh, we had quail everywhere in Clay County. You could walk along without a dog and jump cubbies, and uh, we had a half hound and a half bird dog, and that devil would tree squirrels, run rabbits, and point quail. What was his name? <laughs> I don't even Dumbo. remember. Too many years ago. <laughs> what are you, Mississippi but, uh, leg hound? Yeah, that's right. And, but it seemed like to me that when agricultural practices changed drastically in this part of the country, quail population started declining, and then we had about billions of fire ants move in. And I think they have a drastic effect on the young. Well, I, you know, we've asked Li- Olivia this, and, 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 and I guess there's probably varied opinions. Uh, but in the Olivia, you're from Maine, so you may not have experienced this, but in September, if you go on a dove shoot, if, David, if you'll take her on a dove shoot this September. Yeah, we've been. Okay. Well, if you leave a dove laying on the ground for more than just a few minutes, when uh, you I'm pick him up, he's in, covered in fire ants. Yeah. So, so red, red imported fire ants, um, the, uh, they're from uh, South America? Somewhere? Came up through from South America Mobile. through yeah. Mexico, <laughs> Texas, yeah. and Mobile. Yeah. Mobile brought them in as yeah. ballast yeah. in the and, dirt and they, in they the are, 1950s. Dang it! Yeah, check yeah. me on that, Mike. But I think that's they right. are they are not helpful to quail, right? right. They they don't help, uh, and they will eat some chicks uh, for sure. But we also have, uh, and so those are exotic fire ants. We also have native fire ants that quail have come up with that aren't as aren't nearly as aggressive as as uh, red imported fire ants. But uh, I think Olivia mentioned uh, when she was on. Yeah, fire ants are bad, but they're not the main cause. They just don't help anything, mm-hmm. right? Because if you go to like the Red Hills. Or parts of Texas where there's quail everywhere. There's a after a fire, you you can't go ten feet and ten yards right. without seeing a fire ant man. Same same uh, around here. Yeah, yeah. Oh man, look, when you light fires around here, that's when you go count how many you've got. So they aren't good. I've had a, I've, I when I've done research at Tall Timbers during when I was uh, during my uh, undergraduate education, you go out there and I, I'd had nests that would hatch and fire ants would get to them and eat every chick, you know, and that was brutal. But they um, everything eats a quail. There, there's hardly anything on the landscape that won't eat a Bob White. Tall Timbers used to have a video of deer eating eggs out of the nest. Mm. Uh, 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 my old boss had a study down in, in South uh, Florida, had a bullfrog eat a radioed quail chick. They got yeah, it in Garden right. Gun Magazine. Yeah. Now granted, does that mean we need to start a bullfrog eradication program? No, no. although that'd be delicious. Yeah. The, uh, <laughs> it's just that everything, cotton rats, I've had cotton rats eat chicks, or the, you know, it, there's nothing out there. Every snake, everything with fur, everything. Birds, blue jays, crows, uh, everything wants to eat a quail at some point in its life. So fire ants didn't help anything, but, uh, you know, quail don't live that long anyway. People don't believe me when I tell them this. Even in the best habitat in the world, 20% of the birds are going to, or only about 20% are going to live throughout the year. They have about an 80% mortality rate. Oh, wow. I never realized that. I had one bird survive for my study last year and this year, and that was the most exciting thing one. ever. Yeah, <laughs> one bird who... Who lived over the last Yeah, and he's still alive. I heard him this morning. And that's, oh, that's low. Oh, right. yeah. <laughs> that's low. Wild wow, birds. Yep, yep. And that's low. We want more that. than that. Uh, yeah. But yeah. They just seem, so, you know, their, their populations have been knocked back so far, except in those, you know, strongholds like Texas and uh, the Red Hills and Georgia. But uh, uh, my family land, when I was a kid, it was just 
coming out of being decent quail habitat in Holmes County, Mississippi, you know, in the hills on the edge of the Delta. Um, and my dad and his friends, you know, grew up hunting around there and, and had a lot of quail. And then when I was young, I remember seeing coveys from time to time. And then it was like you flipped a switch and you never saw them. And then in 2010, we had an F5 tornado come through there. So it was a mile and a quarter wide of complete and total destruction. And in less than a year, I saw two coveys. Mm. Yeah. Sunlight on the ground. Sunlight on the ground. They're, they like fire. And they like It was just like, boom, they came right back. And that, like I said, hurricanes, tornadoes, big thunderstorms, that was one of the tip, one of the traditional kind of disturbance patterns, regimes we saw throughout the southeast uh, that happened so frequently that kind of created some of those things. And, of course, mm. wildfires, too. Uh, but I hear that all the time. I've got a, 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 a farmer in North Louisiana called me and said, man, I, I just started – doing no-till, and all of a sudden I've got a covey. I said, you just do no-till? He's like, no, I did a cover crop too. Bam, covey showed up. And and I said, well, what about your neighbors? Oh, they just put some CRP in. Bam, covey showed up. And then I had a relative call me from about 20 miles from that guy and said, hey, I just had a covey show up on my property. This is ag-dominated, you know, the the Louisiana side of the Delta, right, you know, the right. Mississippi Valley. Not real great quail country. And uh, same thing, they put in some CRP. Those first few years of those hardwood plantings are mostly just grasses and forbs. Really nice quail cover. Bam, Covey shows up. And so you see that. You co- we call it the new ground effect. When you create right. new ground for them, they, they explode, and they kind their populations go, now's the time, let's make as many chicks as we can, and then they'll start to stabilize a little. And it, it may be when it's that new, uh, you know, predators and things may not have moved in quickly enough. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, but that, uh, that would vary. They yeah. all, I assume they just have this built-in drive to populate a Look, new like area. I said, they, 20% annual survival is good. And uh, but they were they, they make up for that for being really really productive. You know they'll have multiple nests a year. Uh, hens will actually even if she has a successful nest and the brood makes it, she, there's a good probability she's going to nest again. So they're going to try and try and try until they get a clutch off. A lot to do in a year. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Olivia, can you kind of walk us through? Uh, this is about the time of year we start hearing turkeys whistling. So what what's going on? Turkeys? Man? No. Excuse me, excuse me. We start when we're turkey hunting. We start hearing <laughs> quail whistle. Yeah. So right now uh, they're just breaking up out of their cubbies that they had formed over the winter and the fall, um, and so they're breaking up out of those cubbies right now. And you know they started whistling probably only a week or two ago, at least here. Um, the farther south you go, they begin whistling a little bit earlier on, and basically they're just trying to um, find mates and then reproduce, and then we should have nests on the ground. You know, it can start as early as now or, you know, a couple of weeks from now, we should start seeing nests on the ground. So, so is it similar to a wild turkey where yeah. he's whistling? Are they are the hens coming to him? It kind of varies. So sometimes, um, usually, uh, if a male's calling, females will go to them. But I've also had males um, go towards females, too. So I think it depends. Would you say? Yeah, and I've, I've seen turkeys do the same thing, too. I, oh, yeah. I've, yeah. I've sat there and watched, you know, uh, a turkey hen scream. And then from when I couldn't hear him to all the way, she never moved from the size of this room. Gobbler came what seemed like, you know, half a mile. Yeah. And she never, she never, she never moved. And of course we've seen it the other way too, where you're calling them in. So it's, it's really variable, but yeah, they, uh, they definitely, they're, they're starting to nest, get a breed nest. Uh, one of my other grad students, he's working down at, uh, the Jones research station. They call it Itchua. It's a really 29,000 acre longleaf plantation research center down in uh, South Georgia. He had his first nest start incubating, I think, last week, so a little bit earlier than, than here. Uh, and then every now and then you'll have a bird that just nests crazy early, and, you know, you'll end up. I, so I had a guy tell me he saw some chicks on the ground the other day, and I'm like, mm-hmm. yeah, that's crazy. So sometimes you hear these, these males whistle, and they sound desperate. It, it <laughs> yeah. seems like it gets more yeah. and more and more intense. Yeah, so part of my research is trying to figure out um, why they do and do not call on certain mornings. So for example, I went out this morning and did uh, a 10 minute calling survey. So I just went out to where one of my radio collared males is that I found the night before, go out, make sure he's still there. And I basically just sit there at sunrise and I record how many times he calls in 10 different minute intervals. And then I'm also recording how many males around him are calling. And some birds, like this morning, I had five males radio collared. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I had five radio collared males around me. Not a single one sang. It was hmm. a perfect morning. I mean, there was a little bit of fog, but, you know, it was fine. Yesterday morning I went out, 100% cloud cover, you know, like pretty windy. 
and I had one male who called like 40 something times in 10 minutes. So we're trying to figure out why, you know, why certain mornings they call right. and why sometimes they don't. You know how turkey hunting will drive you crazy? No. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Can't you see it in our eyes? Lose sleep. <laughs> Trying to understand Bob White calling behavior is just as infuriating because yeah. she she's had birds do things that just just like I said, typically you think they're not supposed to call much in a cloudy day, right? That's what the the, the research tells us. But you never know if he bred the day before, and, and sometimes they're not calling because they're hinned up, just like a gobbler, you know. Mm. But uh, oh, it's infuriating. Uh, yeah. It's it's so frustrating. Yeah, I think I calculated it just off my last year's um, data. It was like a 30% probability that a bird would call during any time I would go out to do a survey. So that's, that's incredibly low. And then when you have to do population counts for quail based off of these 10 minute calling surveys, then you're pretty much going to always underestimate your population because you go out there and you know, there could be 10 quail there, but you're not hearing them and they're not singing. So you're not recording those 10 birds. So you're kind of always going to, you may always bias your population estimate lower than it actually is. So we're just trying to figure out, you know, is there a certain day or type of weather that might be better to go out and do a survey for? Or are there ways to account for that variability in modeling? Because there are certain models that you do to get a population um, a population estimate for your property. So we just want to know what sort of variables should we factor into those models to account for the fact that, you know, if it's a cloudy day that you go out and do a survey, you know, if you only hear one bird calling, well, actually, maybe there's three. So there's these model, like, mo like statistical modeling that we can do to account for um, that, th that variability mm -hmm. in their calling. What kind of tracking device do you use? Yeah, so, whale? yeah, it's called um, radio telemetry. So they're these, these little, uh, basically a necklace. It's just a necklace radio collar, and we just fit it over their head, and we kind of ruffle up their feathers around it so, you know, it's not flapping in their face or in their mm -hmm. way. They're, you know, you make it tight enough so they can't get their legs stuck through it. So it's just, um, yeah, it's just a radio collar, and it only weighs about 5% of their body weight, um, so it doesn't really interfere with their flight or anything. Um, there's been a ton of studies to make sure that that's I didn't know we case. all had an inserted device. No, nope, no, it's just a, it's just a radio. It's not collar. a GPS unit. It's just no. So that would be nice. Yeah, it <laughs> then would. I wouldn't have to be out there every day yeah. walking around trying to find them. It would be nice, but no, it's uh, it's called VHF. So you have to go out there on foot and well, walk around and yeah. yep with a yagi and henna and try. I've seen y'all do that before. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So how do you catch them? Um, usually, the normal way is through what's called a baited funnel trap. Um, it's just basically a square trap with a hole in it. They can get in, and then we'll we'll bait it with Milo. Um, that usually seems to work pretty well, and they go in and they can't get out. That's usually how we do it. We do that in the fall and winter when the birds are in coveys. So if you get one, you're more than likely going to get other birds in that covey. Um, I had one trap this year get um, pr pretty much the whole covey in it minus one bird, which was lucky. That bird yeah. was already radio collared, so that, nice. that worked out well for me. He said, I've done this before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not he going in there to put a necklace yeah. on me. <laughs> Whereas I had some last year, like the same one would go in every single day, oh, yeah. and I was like, was okay, well, we're going to pull that trap because whatever. How long do they last before they run out of power? Um, I think it's like it's a, six eight. months sort of around there. Ish. It's, supposed Plus to be it's supposed to be eight to nine. She She's had some unfortunate... Uh, bad luck with her radios, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, generally eight, eight, nine months. I've heard y'all talk about you know they're they're coveyed up in the fall. What's the behavior like other times of year? I, I'm I'm so ignorant to quail. Like I always think of them in a covey. So what about can you play the female whistle? We we've been playing the male whistle. Yeah, so but I is have that, um, or Matt, can you? She, are you, you cutting you my just question? Just derailed. Trying to ask what they're doing. Okay, well, <laughs> while she's looking yeah. for that, yeah. Yeah. I got her right here. Oh, okay. right. So this is um this is the female. I've heard that a lot and didn't know what it was. Yeah, I actually heard that this morning. Yeah. I heard the five males not saying anything, her yelping, but I heard huh? her going, yeah. and she's like, where are you guys? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but um, that's the call I'll use, too, when I do um, the mist netting, targeted mist netting, which is another way that I try to capture them. Mm -hmm. So I'll basically play that off a Bluetooth speaker behind, um, I think it's like a 12 meter, I think it's how long? Yeah, like a 12 meter long, really fine mesh mist net. And I'll play that off a Bluetooth speaker, trying to get a male to come get stuck in the net and then when to i see fly them, in yep to fly in to walk in i only had one fly in the rest of them you'll you'll, you'll be looking you'll see them kind of come through the grass and they'll be making all these noises trying to figure out where the female is so that's kind of back to one of the questions where i think it was your question bobby where you were saying um do the males go towards the females or the females towards the males 
Sometimes the males will come in. Other times, I think they just sit there calling their head off, like expecting her to go, and which doesn't work out for me. <laughs> I can't catch them that way. But right. so they're scattered out, and then I guess in in the fall and winter they're they're grouped up, and then they spread out. Yep. Yeah. So because they want to try to like um, expand. The genetic diversity as much sure. as possible. So yeah. you don't obviously want to breed with the same individuals in your covey. Yeah, that's what I was getting at. So different quails need to breed, uh, different coveys need to breed. Yes, because a lot of times, last year I had a brood um, that hatched pretty late, and they just stayed together because it was so close to fall anyways. That whole brood just ah, stayed together. Mm-hmm. So they just stayed up and coveyed up over the winter, and then obviously they can't interbreed with each other, so they have to disperse out to try to well, I mean, breed they can, others. but yeah. they probably don't want well, to. So yeah. these little yeah. chicks, they, they breed, and then they have a clutch of, of little bitty quail, and then after those quail mature, they go to their own coveys. They don't stay together. If they hatch early in the summer, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, they – you, you don't coveys aren't always family groups right. uh, and then actually sometimes they are like a late hatch brood will typically stay together but then throughout the fall there's a fair amount of covey mixing in fact there's actually a fair amount of brood mixing during the summer because sometimes a predator or somebody uh, scares okay. up a brood and a chick ends up with another uh, brood uh, they did they did the study at tall timbers and it is way more prevalent than probably most people would think but yeah so generally they'll spend most of they're breaking up about now they're spending all summer separately unless they're you know nesting or raising a brood together. So a male's by himself and a, and a female's got her little brood and just kind of... Sometimes the male will help with parenting duties. Sometimes he won't. It just depends on what his breeding opportunities are. Yeah. Uh, if he if he can breed somebody else and have that, he's probably going to do, do that. that. Yeah. Yeah. Males will actually sometimes incubate nests. Huh. Yeah, we see it like 20, 25, 30% of the time. And typically it happens when... Uh, there's very few available hens left. Like there's very few hens, most of the hens are already nesting, so the male's got to make a choice. All right, I got to get some some genetics in the next generation. What do I do? I can keep screaming my head off and attracting every hawk in the county. Maybe I'll just go sit on a nest. So we actually see see males incubate. Nature uh, is so amazing. Yeah, that's, I, I mean, she, he keeps talking. I keep on thinking of questions because I'm going to ask about avian yeah, predation. Yeah, DNA studies profiling on them to determine how much inbreeding occurs. That's way outside of my uh, <laughs> expertise. Uh, I mean, we do that with the dogs. Yeah, mm-hmm. but yeah. I, but uh, yeah, we have no uh, inbreeding coefficients for, for bob whites, <laughs> uh, co- coefficient of inbreeding. But uh, so, yeah, I don't, I don't get a pedigree like from my dog that shows me. But there's some, there was a researcher. He did his uh, Brant Faircloth. Uh, he was the first one I remember doing a lot of it. He showed some really cool stuff about like multiple paternities, mm-hmm. multiple fathers in a clutch. Right, because they can actually hens can actually store store semen, mm-hmm. so they actually don't always release it all at once to fertilize the egg. That's like a turkey. Uh, yeah, turkeys yeah. can do it too. It's just like uh, dogs. Yeah, you can breed a dog to six different males, and every puppy you can identify every puppy by doing DNA studies mm-hmm. yeah. on them as to which male fathered that puppy. I think we're generally talking about Bob Whites, but there's other quail out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, are there populations? Dwindling, similar to, to Bob White? Yeah, generally speaking, for the most part. So you got blue quail or scaled quail. Uh, now, that, that system's, you know, that's a boom and bust system over there with, with rainfall, right? So if it's wet, they do fine. You know, if it's really bad droughts, they tend to suffer more. You got mountain quail, Montezuma quail, uh, California quail. None of them are doing gambles. Yeah, none of them are doing great. But uh, it really just comes down mostly to how much that landscape has changed, right? Mountain quail are probably never occurred in really high densities, but they're probably But their landscape is fairly similar. It's it's not nearly as uh, prone to human intervention as— Right, they don't have cattle grasses and big ag and all of that They definitely don't have big ag, but uh, grazing out west is probably a factor. Sure. Um, So, yeah, we have all these other species, and none of them are doing just great. But then again— Almost none of the galliforms are just, you know, killing right. you know, none of them are just going, man, we're just as good as we've been. So, Mark, I, w- growing up as a, as a kid, I had a b- bird dog. I mean, it, that was part of my life. I, first thing I ever trained was build a little English pointer named rub, Jim. Rub it in. Keep it going. So, <laughs> but, 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 but hear me out. I can remember my dad and the people that, that we would hunt with talk about Mexican quail. And I never really knew what they were talking about. But recently I read, and I think it may have been like in the 1970s, that there were some quail brought into the south from Mexico to try to to breed in with the wild quail that we had. It, yeah. Is there some truth in that? I've heard about that, honestly, but I don't know if that's really true. I mean, there's, I mean, Bob Whites themselves, just the Bob White, there's like 23 different subspecies of Bob White, right, if you ask a geneticist. 
uh, and they go all the way down to the Yucatan and that, and that kind of stuff. Um, so I don't know if those were just a, a, one of the subspecies of Bob White at the time or if it was something else. There's mask Bob White that you get in South America that, you know, are a, are a type of Bob White. Uh, so I don't know for sure, but I, I've heard that a lot. I just don't, I don't know. Yeah, um, they called them Mexican quail. Huh? Yeah, just, when I was a kid. The, everybody around here said, oh, they brought these Mexican quail in. They're smaller than the Bob White. Hmm. And uh, they were, whatever they were, they were smaller were than small. the average Bob White. Plenty but of- everybody complained about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you remember the very first podcast we did, I did a little Bob White factoid, and it was that they sleep in a circle, all oh, facing yeah. out. I remember that. And I've, I've always thought that was just the neatest thing. that, And I don't think everybody realizes that. But it's such a they, – they, I think they do it for warmth and they do it for protection. But if you've ever stepped in the center <laughs> of one, you'll, you'll never forget it. Well, look, yeah, they say so in that covey during the, during the fall and winter when they're in a group of covey, yeah, they sleep all pointing out. Uh, so there's a, that's thermal regulation for one, stay warm. And then two, it's more vigilant, right? Everybody's eyes are out. Uh, and then sometimes in a really big covey, you may see some individuals sit in the middle – some really cool stuff we've done. It wasn't really a part of Olivia's research. We, we did it with a previous grad student, and then the technology got better. But that covey ring just always fascinated me, and I started thinking about what that would look like with a thermal camera. Mm. And so we tried it with one student, and we didn't have the kind of the best thermal cameras, but we put them on drones. And my idea was I'd love to just fly around a property so many coveys I could find because there's nothing else that's going to look like that little donut. No, you're right. So the first time we tried it, we could see it, but we didn't really have the technology we needed, and we didn't know it. And then a colleague of mine, Ray Iglay, him and his uh, students have have got some great thermal cameras. So we, one of our coveys that was radio, we went up and, and we were, I don't know, 40, 50 yards away from it. And he went up and he goes to look for it. And Olivia told him it was kind of in this area. And then you're looking at a thermal camera on his little iPad that's connected to the to the camera on the drone. And you just see this ring, just this thermal no ring. No doubt about it. Unmistakable. Mm-hmm. And I got so excited. I probably said some things I shouldn't have. And he was pretty excited. I was pretty excited. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've been waiting so long to yeah, confirm see, that that happened, yeah, right? Yeah. And she's got a picture of it. And then, so this was the cool part. She, they hovered over it, and we went out there. We had nets and everything. So we had, I think you had one or two radio birds in that covey. Two. We, we wanted yeah. to get, we, it, it's kind of like the Judas pig approach, right? You mark one pig, and she takes you to the other pigs. Well, we were going to do the Judas quail, right? We're going to catch the rest of y'all. So we go out there, and we've got, a, it's pitch black at night. We've got a spotlight. And the guy with the drone, I think it was like 100 feet up in the air, and he's looking at it. And I've got a spotlight, and we've uh, we've got n- hoop nets, and actually took a cast net, didn't throw it, just kind of spread it out. And uh, I'll be doggone. Look, look at that. that. Isn't that something? Ha. Zoom in on it. You can see the individual birds. Yeah, you can. That's which is really cool, too. Like, if you could, like, individually <laughs> count it. birds, it'd be so cool. Yeah. Looks like a donut. Yeah. <laughs> No so way. we went out there and uh, we couldn't, he's like, it's right there. Well, he can see it on the camera, but it's dark. We can't right. see it. So I'm just panning my spotlight back and forth and you can see the spotlight beams on the thermal camera. And he's like, stop. <laughs> there it so is. as soon as it lined up with where the covey was, he stopped and I held it and they walked up and set the cast net on it. And that first attempt, we only caught a handful of them. So they're working up, Olivia and her, her people are helping her working up those birds, putting radios on them. And then he looks at me, he's like, hey man, I see the other one. Like he can see it on the camera. Cause it flushed off, so he and I went over there, and I just—he's like, "It's right there," and I just put a, a hoop net on top of it and and, and it called him. So we started a little late. They we we weren't able to be that successful every time, but um, it's a new area of capturing and counting cubbies we want to explore. Yeah, no doubt yeah. about it. And it's just it's so fun. fun. Right. <laughs> it's yeah. so fun. Yeah, it's so cool a, Olivia, is it? I've always heard that wild quail will fly to their roost, and in the morning, then they fly off of their roost, so that they start the day with no scent trail. Is that? Am I, is that a wife tale or is that true? I've never actually heard that before. I, I'm i not sure. They definitely fly to the roost. Uh, they probably do a mix of both, but uh, I've seen I've watched coveys come off roost before. I don't have a huge sample size of this and just kind of and just kind of walk off. But uh, they yeah we definitely see them fly to the roost usually it, when they're in a covey. Now mm-hmm. her research is looking at roosting behavior during the breeding season, which no one's ever done before. Yeah. So, but yeah, generally that's mostly true. They're trying to minimize the scent trail, but they will walk sometimes, yeah. but it's probably preferable. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen them because I'll find them early in the morning because I'll find them where they're roosting at night and then go out in the morning early enough where they shouldn't necessarily be like far from the roost. I've never seen them fly 
from where they're roosting. I think normally, at least in the morning. Like and that's breeding even, season too. Yeah. yeah. So, so they're on the ground different. and they'll pitch up in the air and land back on the ground to. It just flies to, short. Yeah, just short yeah. distance. Yeah. Quail don't ever fly very far. Right. right. They're just not built for. Yeah. Right. They glide, uh, yeah. but they. But yeah, when you, you say so, roost, you know, I think on a limb, I'm like, well, oh yeah, sorry, no, roost room. is just yeah. kind of where they're spending the night. So, yeah. I, I, look, in my younger day, when I in in high school and college, I got to growing up in Montgomery, I got to hunt deer hunt on a bird plantation, and it, it was this guy. All he cared about in the world was wild quail, and they burned it every year and planted birds. It was just just a fantastic place but i can remember seeing those quail do that flying to to, it's to roost and i can i can remember in the going in the dark walking and stepping in the center of some and but i can also remember this man spending so much money on this habitat and this property and the wild birds would leave and go next door where it <laughs> had no improvements had been done at all but it was like they equally ranged on this unimproved ground and the improved ground much like turkeys, they'll drive you to drinking. Uh, they they will do things that make that seem to make no sense to us. But what I tell I tell you what I tell my students when we talk about this, I was like, well, we like to think that animals can only afford to always do the right thing, right? So I tell my college students in class, what if I put a radio on you, and I track your movements every th- few hours of the day? How many of the places I'm going to find you are good for your survival? Mm. All right, and they get a big chuckle out of that right. because they all know where they were last night and right. all the stuff they've been doing. So sometimes animals just do things that we wish they wouldn't do. Uh, Olivia's got birds that will go roost in a fescue field, and it infuriates me because <laughs> I've spent a great deal of my career killing, killing fescue and trying to get rid of it. Now, that doesn't mean they have a really good survival. Though. Hell, a lot of them get eaten. <laughs> yeah. And it could be that they're roosting in the wrong spot. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, animals will just do things that, I mean, you've, you've seen the deer labs, deer. Why does that deer keep crossing the Mississippi River back and forth, right? Right. What is he getting out of that? Why well, does a mature buck <laughs> move during the middle of the day? You so know, in so that rare. covey, is there like one old hen bird and she's calling the shots? And You know, there hasn't been a whole lot of research looking at hierarchies uh, with, with quail. With most flocking critters, you do seem to, to see some type of social hierarchy. Uh, there was some, uh, Speak did some re- research in the 70s that probably looked at it, but it was probably more pen raised birds. So I don't know for sure. Um, I don't know. Really there doesn't cool seem to be. Any, and like I say, you're not going to live that long, so right. who are you going to listen to? Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I never realized that their lifespan was so short. Yeah, it's, good. Yeah, it's sad. Yeah, it's, it's so fast. But So what about, you know, we hear about uh, chicken litter. Uh, all the time I hear people complaining about it. Have you guys got any thoughts on that? So you hear about it a lot in, in the turkey world. Is a lot of people say, well, people start putting chicken litter on a pasture and then the turkeys disappeared. Uh, when I was at UGA, this came up all the time, and uh, I scoured the peer-reviewed literature. I talked to the poultry people, talked to everybody. There are some diseases and some paras- and some stuff that can come in in certain types of chicken litter, but it depends on what type of chicken house it is. Like uh, bro- broiler yeah. versus egg, I yeah. think. And one of them's more risky than the other, but the last I checked, the one I can't remember that was most risky wasn't the one that's most of the litter's coming from that gets spread for fertilizer. Um what I told people in Georgia, because I would get this call all the time in Georgia, and I'm, you think about how long people have been using chicken litter. I mean, this is not a novel technique, right? This is this is age old, as you know, long as you've had chicken houses. Right. And uh, I, I had a guy who just was adamant that he didn't have any turkeys anymore as a result of this. And, and he said, well, that's the only thing that's changed. And I said, well, yeah, because the landscape changed, and, you know, you got to cut trees and light fires. And, and, and so... To my knowledge, Bobby, there I have not seen any literature that shows there's a there that is driving uh, turkey or quail population uh, declines. It could be like fire ants; it probably it might not help. But most of the thing that's affecting all our galliforms, all our game birds, at least our our, our ground nesting non duck ones, it, it's generally the landscape and habitat, right? I mean, um, it, there's a, like let's say a lot of talk in the turkey world right now, but we could be doing a lot more to manage for turkeys on a lot of properties too. And same thing with quail; it's just you know. When you take fire and you stop cutting trees, you take those two things away, the animals that depend on them are going to decline. So I'm not going to dismiss it as outright benign, but there's no research currently that shows that's driving anything. I know uh, if you raise quail, gastroenteritis is a real problem. If you don't have some kind of antibiotic in your quail food, you're going to lose a lot of them. I just just thought of that in relation to using chicken litter. And there's a lot of... 
everything, all animals, humans included, can get parasites and get stuff like that. You know, uh, red grouse in Europe, you know, they get this nematode that just can can really affect their population. So they feed them medicated grit. You know, it's this cra- it's a management strategy over there. You know, we don't see that much over here. Uh, and man, I get a lot of calls. People will call me because they, they hear I'm the quail guy, and they'll call me about a, a quail house or pen raised birds, and I'm like. I, I don't know the first thing about raising a pen raised quail. So I, I have to send them to the poultry department and they don't want to answer questions about <laughs> quail houses because they're, they do mostly chicken stuff. So, um, I know surprisingly little about raising pen raised quail. I've never done it. Uh, hmm. I've raised a few fowls. <laughs> I'm going to send them to you then. <laughs> <laughs> one of the, one of my neighbors by my quail pen, I don't do it anymore. I've still got all the equipment to hatch 1400 eggs at a time. But, uh, I went out one day coming out deer hunting. And I was coming through the pines, and it was quail everywhere. I said, well, where these quail came from? I got over there, and these kids had left my quail pen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. but, it looks like my quail. <laughs> it is my quail. <laughs> you Get still don't see any of them out there in the woods because they don't live long. Yeah. They yeah. don't preen like they do in the wild, and they don't develop oil. Oh, pen-raised birds live, live even shorter than, than, yeah. than, than, uh, than wild ones. Yeah, so, uh, Lanny, I, the, the, the whole pen bird, it just... Something about it. It just doesn't say it's not the same. But go ahead. Well, you had a question. I was asking about going. Yeah, I'm skipping around, so you know how I am. Yeah. Uh, just wondering, you know, obviously spending more time in the field looking at turkeys more than anything, do, do male quail fight over breeding? They won't defend a territory like some other birds. They will get into, I, I would call it uh, scuffles maybe sometimes. They'll the squirmish. Yeah. They'll run at each other and whatever, and you can see them kind of jump at each other and spur, yeah. but it's it's nothing It's nothing like... Uh, He's a gentleman. Yeah. <laughs> gentleman, gentleman ball. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Look, down that, in South Florida, my old ball said there, he, he, he'd watch males, you know, really get after it, but that's a real open landscape. It's a little more visible, and he's, you know, it looks like they're defending a territory, right. but his... They t- generally don't. So, yeah, they'll, they'll get into it, but nothing as aggressive as some other. Hmm. It's nothing like two bucks going at it or anything right. like that. So, Mark, I just finished reading a book a few months ago. A, a guy from France had moved to Florida and bought a 1,000 acres. His dream was to build a quail. This must hunt, be one of our place. gamekeeper subscribers. It, it, well, I, I, don't, I can't remember his name, but the book is called All for a Fistful of Feathers. And it talks about all the, th- all the things you've mentioned. He's just... You know, bought the properties, fighting fire ants. He's trying to turn fescue back into all the all the things you talk about. And he evidently he was a wealthy guy, but he's so he sat down with his accountants and they was explaining <laughs> what all he'd been oh, doing. Yeah. So he told him, he said, "You know, guys, the gamekeeper, the farmer in me wants to plant all these crops for the quail." And he said, "The biologist in me wants to do all this work and make all this the, the, the improvements on the habitat for the quail." And he said, the business man in me recognizes that this is a completely losing situation. hundred percent. But the child in me doesn't care. Mm-hmm. And I, I just love that. That Was he that, doing release birds or was he trying to do wild he birds? He was trying to do wild yeah. birds. Yeah. yeah. If, you, if you get a property that is in good shape, like, like I said, the, there's a property up in North Mississippi that, that we uh, my students monitor for, for the landowner and we're probably uh, going to do some research there when, when Olivia's project's over. But the uh, it's in pretty good shape. I was telling you about it at lunch. There's a couple spots where you needed to burn more. But he could, he's got wild birds on it probably more than anywhere in the state of Mississippi and uh, that I've ever seen. And he can manage the entire place with nothing more than a, tr- a disc and a drip torch. He doesn't have to plant a food plot. He doesn't have to. The t- trees have already been mostly gutted. It's very low, very low timber density, just fire. He can enjoy and hunt those quail enough to hunt. Wow! Uh, with just with just fire. So that's that's the a good case there when you get that. That's the property you want to buy. When you buy a property that's got fescue or you got a property that's got this other stuff, yeah, it's a little it's a little more work. Um, I've worked with a lot of uh, when I was in Georgia, a couple of plantations. One in particular is three thousand acre block, and they actually could have some wild birds. But the the gentleman that owned it was a wealthy older gentleman. And he wanted to flush, you know, a covey every five minutes. So it was all release. They did September release, let the birds kind of wild up a little bit. They'd run them on, work them on labs to get them flushing more for a few a month or two. Then when quail season started, they, they'd bring the pointers and the setters out. And he was spending so much money, it was sickening. He did the math on what it cost per bird that he shot. No one in their right mind would, would want to do that. But he was happy. 
And he said, I, he said, it's, it's almost as good as a wild covey. I know it's not. He goes, but I'm old. I don't need, you know, I, I'm good. And, and he was telling everybody, don't even bother with wild birds. Don't even bother with wild birds. Well, this guy was hunting seven days a week. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's very few places wild birds you can hunt seven days a week. Yeah. He wanted to hunt at that intensity. It wasn't even a commercial operation. And, um, but, you know, to him, same thing. The money was is what he wanted to spend it on because he it was the, like I said, it was the kid in him. He just he just wanted to flush a cover every five minutes. He wasn't going to walk more than five minutes without flushing a cover. He was going to go back to the house. Now that's an extreme example. Uh, a lot of places that are doing you know put out pin birds. A lot of people just do it once or twice a year because they want to. They just want to have a shoot with their kids or something like that. And I, I still get questions every day. I, I thought we had put the book to rest on this. Well, if I just keep releasing them, won't that restore them? No. There's never been a case where released birds, pin raised birds, have successfully restored a population. And and I say, you can do it every year, but that's not sustainable. Like if you stop, it's it's gonna it's gonna be over real quick. But I tell people all the time, you know, I I, I came up, I used to be kind of an elitist about pin raised birds. I never I didn't want to hunt them. I was trying to be a purist quail biologist. I'm only hunting wild birds kind of thing. And uh and then I had to just give all that up because I have kind of a love-hate relationship with pin raised operations. Part of me wishes they didn't exist some days because then we'd all be focused on wild birds. Mm-hmm. But then I know we wouldn't all be focused on wild birds yeah. because for some people, that's the only access they have right. to wild birds. To get my son upland hunting in Mississippi, that's pretty much what it's I've got to do. do. And I, so I've come to terms with that. And my old boss, uh, James Marty, is a professor at UGA. We were talking about this on the phone the other day. And he said, you know, it's kind of like uh, fast food, right? Well, I have a garden if you can just go get fast food. And that's what pen raised quails become because we don't have to try for wild birds because a lot of people can just go can go pay to hunt to preserve. And they know it's not the same if they've hunted wild birds, but how many people have actually still hunted wild birds that are still actively hunting? I've hunted them one time yeah. my yeah. whole life. A lot and of it people was amazing. That's right. They they have. Have. So I, it's I can remember the last two wild birds I killed. I can remember where I was. I can remember Me too. P- picking them up. I remember walking around for weekends on end following my dad, you know, trying to keep up with this wider uh, footprint. Yeah, gate. And uh, never once jumping, you know, a dove may fly over, we may jump a rabbit or something. And uh, he would say, I would say, Dad, when can I get a 20 gauge? And he'd say, when you can shoot a, a quail, a flush quail in the air with your 410 single shot. I'll get you a 20 gauge. Mm. Just asking a lot. And it, and it, that is and it never lot. happened. <laughs> so he finally just broke down and Look, I've, got I've me been a very fortunate gauge. to be able to hunt wild birds in a, in a, in a handful of states. And, and I'm, you know, I'm 37 years old. And it is, there's a lot of time in between coveys, right? Mm-hmm. But, and this is what I, I, I didn't grow up upland hunting. I grew up duck hunting. I, like I said, I didn't see my first wild quail. I was 21, you know. So I've just fallen in love with upland hunting. Because and I, used, and my wife makes fun of me. She says you got so much gear now. You never had. I was I used to be a minimalist hunter, but now I've got the vest. I've got the shotgun. I've got the fancy boots. I've got the chaps. I'm accessorizing right, and <laughs> and I'm in love with it because the smells of that old cloth yeah. and the feel of all that stuff. Because you've got to find something else. The landscape's one thing to appreciate. The dog is the main reason I'm there, second behind my my children. You've got to find something else to enjoy in between right. those flushes. Absolutely. Well, yeah. I mean, with everything. I think that's similar with a lot of us in turkey hunting uh, in, in Mississippi, uh, where we're not normally as successful as a lot of people in the Midwest. We're, we're going for the sunrise. We're going for the songbirds. We're going for the walk. Mm-hmm. We're going, you know, for looking at the trees. Uh, that's what we enjoy. And, and, you know, the bird hunters of yesteryear, I think a lot of it was just so folks could get out out of the house and walk around and, and have a good day. Um, the dogs were a big part of it back yeah. then, too. Oh, yeah. So both of y'all, you're coming at this from, a, you've been a hunter for a long time. Olivia's new to the hunting part of this thing. but So I'm going to ask a question and get both of y'all perspective. But when you've opened up the Mississippi regulations and it says you can kill, I think it's, I think it's, 15, it's either 12 or 15 quail, and the season lasts from November to but late into the year and he, Until February, uh, yeah, yeah, the end of February. It, it, is that framework good or is, or does that need to be tightened up a little bit? <laughs> so we talk Hot about seat. this a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So, Here we go. See, the Bobby's gritty. like doing your oral exam. Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> does that mean we don't have to do the oral exam? <laughs> no. Yeah, okay. Record it. <laughs> um, yeah. Right. Um, 
So it's funny because a lot of people think you would think, you know, quail populations are declining. It's about, what, like 2.4, it's like 2.4% a year or something like that. Anyways, they're declining. And so you think with such a high bag limit, you know, why don't we lessen that? Because obviously you don't want to take more out of the population that's sustainable. But I can personally say from, I mean, I've only ever done the pen raised quail hunting. Um, They are very hard to shoot. So the likelihood of anybody going out and shooting 12 birds, getting your bag limit a day is like, I mean, props to you if you can do that, but it's probably not going to happen anyhow. So, I mean, they, they could reduce the bag limit, but it doesn't, it doesn't really matter because you're probably not going to shoot 12 anyhow. And then in, in, you know, areas where you can shoot 12, it probably is a fine. That that's a sustainable number for that population anyhow. Yeah. So wild, yeah, that, that, that's a pretty good answer. Uh, it's very, there's not that many people that do it. Uh, some of the most avid quail hunters in the state, uh, they're definitely not killing, you know, whatever the limit is, eight, I thought, but maybe it is 12, I can't remember. Uh, so quail hunting at low densities, which is most of the state of Mississippi, it's kind of almost self-regulating, you know? And it, we, we, we definitely have, there's been ample research, there's really no evidence to suggest that hunting is contributing to the decline because hunting is so rare and scant across the landscape. So the state, and I'm not going to speak for the state agencies, but generally I think their philosophy is, this is what they're dealing with with the turkeys too right now, is do you take away opportunity if there's no guarantee that it's going to be some tangible benefit to to the public's going to see, right? So right now with quail, I think what a lot of states have said is, you know, no one, not enough people are doing this, at least not in Mississippi, to where it's affecting the population. So let's just, let's not tinker with it because somebody's going to get mad. Yeah. Even if they never hunt, mm-hmm. they only hunt three days a year. Uh, so the states have to balance kind of the, the public perception with the science. And right now the science doesn't suggest that we're overshooting quite. It, yeah, I've, uh, it, I've shot wild birds in Georgia, Florida, Texas, and Kansas. But to give you an example, I felt them hunt Kansas and uh, on a uh, control shooting here. And the phone, the guy that owns the land, his phone rang. He said, hey, Bill, come here. So I walked over where he was. He said, listen to this. And he put the speakerphone on. The guy says, I got nine hunters coming in up in Nebraska tomorrow, and they want to shoot wild pheasant. I don't have any. Have you got any? He said, I got all you want. <laughs> so there's people paying, you know, $950 a day, and they think they're shooting wild birds, and they're not. They can't sustain it for wild birds. Yeah, yeah. There's for for a commercial operation, it's 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 impossible. It's hard, yeah. yeah. It it sure is. Lanny, you had a question. Well, I was just um, you know I hadn't thought about this question. I was actually looking to see if the the game laws apply to pinwaraids quail. You know, see, I think that's where I was getting a little different because I think you can kill fifteen pinraised birds. Oh, you can right. kill all you want. You can kill all you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Well, so maybe that's a self-imposed limit that some of those yes. places we've been. And yeah, the pinraised bird season goes over into March. March fifteenth. Yeah. Yeah. The season that's closes long. in February. So, okay, Mac, okay. fact checked. You were right. Eight yeah. birds. So, eight birds seems like a pretty reasonable bag. And, you're and that's to, not pinraised hunting. That's, that's wild, wild, wild birds. Okay. Yeah. yeah pinraised are a yeah, separate issue. You have to have a perm. Like the the operation has to have a permit. And you have to have any small game license, I think, will get you in Mississippi, and it varies by state. But, yeah, that, that the, the limits on those are just regulated by the property because that's not a public resource, right? Gotcha, that's a gotcha. private. That's what I was wondering about. Yeah, they don't, they don't let you, if you run, what, 600 acres in Mississippi for release birds? I don't know what the limit is. Uh, I'm glad there are some limits, but there are some people that, you know, you know and like I said, th- this is one of the more unfortunate things is, you know, you never know who all is releasing birds. Like, you know, the, uh, we were doing a study years ago in the Delta, and we were doing quail surveys in the Delta, right, and uh, around Moon Lake. And uh, not, a, not a bastion of quail, you know, yeah, hunters, you yeah. wouldn't think. And one year we, we heard this crazy number of, of cubbies calling. And we were like, they're coming back. <laughs> like we, we were all kind of like, no, nah, something's going on. So we started calling around, and it just so happened one of the adjacent landowners just for a weekend had thrown out some birds for his, for his kids to shoot. And, you know, a bunch of them made it and we're just calling their, I happened to be there the next morning doing a survey ah. mm-hmm. and we caught that one. We're like, all right, that's, 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 that's probably, that, that was enough to make us go, mm. mm-hmm. but you know, how often does that happen? Cause you never know. There's no rule that says you have to tell the public when you're releasing birds everywhere. Yeah. Well, you have to have a license. You do, but there's no right. one there. We can't access that. I mean, I have then, to fill out a freedom of information act. If you have a, Dog training license for three dollars, you can shoot quail all year round. In Georgia, there were some WMAs. Oh, Bill's on it. 
<laughs> in Georgia, <laughs> that, in Georgia, there were some. On today. <laughs> in Georgia, there were some wildlife management areas that a certain part of the year you could release pen raised birds on just to train your dog. Huh. And as opposed to as I was scientifically, I really needed the help because I was taking my dog to the sand hills to hunt sharpies, and she had never elk hunted. And there was this W made not far from where I lived. I was like, well, this is a terrible thing to do. But but yeah. I, I really need to, to actually he was three my son was three years old and um I swore to his funny story, I'll tell it quick, but I swore to his mother he was three and we didn't think it was thought it was still too early to kill something in front of him. I mm. said, I don't I'm not worried I'm gonna miss anyway. I I'm, I'm worried about the dog and he make sure she's quartering. This is the poodle we we're talking yeah, about. This Frenchie. is when she was in her prime. Frenchie. And uh you know, so I take him with him, and, and, and I say, hey, buddy, daddy's not going to shoot. Just we're going to walk with me. He had a little toy gun with him, and it was this uh, brown top millet field they had planted. This was the training area. And I put a couple of the quail over and walked her back maybe 100 yards away, got her downwind, turned her loose, told her to hunt it up. You know, we had been doing yard work for months. And, of course, I see her getting kind of birdie, and I'm getting excited. He's right beside me. And he was, like I said, he was three. And she goes and she gets her tail starts going. She's a flusher, right? So she flushes them. Those birds get up and instinct took over. I just raised up, smoked one. Wow. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, God. Got him. Right in front of my three year old. And I look down and I'm like, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. And I look down. He's got his gun up and he goes, you smoked him, daddy. <laughs> <laughs> We're in. So I, I called yeah. his mother immediately. I was like, hey, I messed up. We're good. But I think he's good. Yeah. And, uh, and he's been, yeah, he's been awesome. hunting with me ever since. It's oh, amazing how instinctual it is. I couldn't you know? stop myself. No. You know, a bird gets up out of the grass, what are you supposed to do? No, that's right. And, uh, so do what have, questions... Uh, uh, go ahead, Mr. Bell. Do we have eye worms in Mississippi that affect the quail population? I'm so glad you asked about eye worms. Uh, I have not, eye worm? I don't want one of those jokes. I have not seen any documentation oh, okay. in Mississippi <laughs> of eye worms. Not no, to say Texas that. was pretty heavy. Texas has eye worms. Yeah. I'll, I'll say that. Um, whether or not it's really affecting their population, I would argue, is is yet to be uh, quantified in the literature. Uh, but there's there's some there's some differences of opinion there. Um, like I said, all animals have parasites. There are certain times where parasite loads can get too high. So in Texas, they are finding some birds that have a lot of eye worms, uh, and a lot of birds that don't. So yeah, like it just varies. On the Scottish moors, when the uh, tick population goes sky high, they kill the the red uh, grouse. They have a tremendous decrease in populations. Yeah. They yeah. want to burn to kill the ticks. And like here, everybody over there is against the burn. <laughs> so. Yeah, they actually use medicated grit on red grouse over there. They, uh, It's a nematode that they get that actually makes the males more aggressive and, it, and can actually affect their health. So you see these fluctuations in the population, and it's often kind of based off this nematode burden they've got. So they have medicated grit to actually mediate that uh, that nematode burden, so the populations don't fluctuate as strongly. So the you don't have these major troughs in a down year where it's a little. It kind of makes it a little shallower. It's a, it's like it's a legit management strategy. Yeah, medicated. That's, now that's gamekeeping. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> sure. yeah. Y'all should get some people a, from over there. Over yeah, here. yeah, yeah. We those guys have a over there. Gamekeeper degree over there. Those gamekeepers. Game those keeper. guys. My old boss that I mentioned earlier. He went over there to the Game Bird Wildlife Conservancy Trust. I think it's called in Sussex, uh, England. And he did a month as a visiting professor. And he walked around with one of their gamekeepers one day, the guys that do the trapping and all this stuff. He said those guys' knowledge of that of how to manage and how to – he said it just unparalleled. So if y'all get somebody – and they have some great dogs over there. That's okay quite often. <laughs> yeah, I'm about to say yeah. you probably get the dogs over there. <laughs> so what should we be asking you that we hadn't thought of? Olivia, is there anything that comes to mind with your research that you think is interesting that our listeners would could learn from? Well, I was going to say something kind of a while back when you're talking about that quote from that book with, um, like, the kid in him comes out or whatever it is. Um, I just wanted to say that I don't think people realize how important private landowners are for quail because, yeah, the populations are doing really good in areas like tall timbers and stuff that's, you know, but those places are, you know, managed for quail, WMAs, you know, they're managed for quail and for turkey and whatnot. But the private landowner, especially if you get private landowner next to private landowner and everybody, you just start to have this group of people um, working to make their landscape better for quail. I mean, it can make a significant difference. And for me personally, I think that's my favorite part of my job is seeing other people interested in the work that I have. So like I'll have my quail wander on other people's property. So obviously I have to contact them and be like, hey, you know, can I come track my quail that's on your property? And I love nothing more than them calling me and being like, 
oh, you know, like, can you tell me more about the quail? I didn't, like, you know, they knew they had quail, but they got that much more excited about it knowing, like, that I was tracking quail and just re-inspiring people that quail, I mean, we always joke, like, I want to make quail cool again. Like, quail yeah. are so cool, and mm -hmm. it would be so cool to have more people realize what they can do as a private landowner um, to bring quail back on their property. And I kind of want to, like, put a plug in for, for Mark, but he does, like, some really cool precision ag research that we haven't really touched on. And um, I don't know if you want to, like, kind of talk I about that at all. But We just try to find ways to, if you're going to put take ag land out of production and, and put it in some kind of a conservation quail friendly or not, we, we want you to do it on the least productive farm ground you've got. And we, we've just used yield monitors off combines to, and, and to figure out where we can do that so that if you're a farmer, you can only put in conservation is going to make you more money than less money. And uh, so that's, that's an area of kind of maybe a third of my research program focuses on that. But to Olivia's point, the private landowners, if you look at the national and it varies by state, now, some states are much more publicly owned than private. In the Deep South, 70, sometimes 80, sometimes more percent of the land is private owned. It's not public. So these management areas are good. The refuges are good. Goodness, if y'all been to Noxie Refuge and seen the burning they are doing out there, there are quail screaming during the summer uh, at Noxie. Hats off to those guys. They've done a tremendous, tremendous job. But these public areas are just public areas. They're not going anywhere, but they're a fraction of the landscape. So if you want to hear quail more and see quail more and kind of keep quail on the landscape, she's right. It's it's private landowners that are going to get it done because they own seventy plus percent of the of the pro the land. I tell you guys, for, I, I'm just, we're just so proud of y'all. But in Mississippi State is so impressive. The the what's going on for wildlife? Uh, I mean, everybody that we talked to, Mark. Uh, I mean, here you are. <sighs> And you're you're teaching Olivia, and, and look how she's responding, and that she's going to go out in this workplace and make a difference. And but I just I can't tell you, but from from Bronson and Steve to Mary, all these y'all you guys have got it going on over there. I've got the greatest job in the world, man. Like I, people ask me why you're in academia, I was like, I get to wake up every day and figure out how to solve problems, you know, like that. And I I'm fortunate that I care about one bird more than almost anything else, other than maybe my wife, kids, and dogs. And don't quote me on the order there, but. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so I, I I fell in love with this bird years ago, and I, and I I can't get enough of them. You know, when we were catching that covey using the drone, like the probably get in trouble for saying this, I could make it onto me, but like I grabbed the first bird and like like kissed it on the head because I was so <laughs> just so happy to have you know have a wild bird in my hand again. Uh, Y'all may have to edit that out. Yeah, no. But, uh, <laughs> They might get mad at me, but no, yeah, we, that's we one of the reasons. It. It's one of the reasons I came back to Mississippi State was because the the synergy of of the we do some of the most applied research there is, and and I, I tell Bronson all the time I hate to give him any credit because pine goats, you know, they're everywhere, but uh, <laughs> pine goats. Those guys do <laughs> tremendously, tremendously well getting their message out uh, through y'all's platforms and others, just making sure they're showing people that manage and own land in Mississippi or in the country, really what they should and shouldn't do or what they can do. And we're trying to, we're trying to keep up with them usually most of the time because they've just figured it out. And the quail program, Mississippi State, you know, Wes Berger had it for years and it was the best place in the country. It's when I came to grad school. That was, that was the guy to come do quail research with. And then he moved up in administration. We had another guy, James Martin. He was here for a little while and he went to Georgia and then it was vacant for a few years. And then I'm trying to get it going back up again, but it takes, you know, it takes enthusiasm from landowners who want to hear and see quail to, to kind of keep the machine running. Well, I think you're the guy think, to do it. And I, think that, <laughs> I, that. I think that desire to see and hear quail is, is getting bigger. Yes, sir. I, and I, I have seen incredible enthusiasm in the last several years. And look, last year or this year, I can't remember what month we're in, the pandemic has ruined my sense of time, but I guess it was last spring. I got more calls last spring from people saying, man, I just, I just heard of Bob White. And I'll, I'll be able to get on my computer and type in their address and see where they're at. And you look at that landscape and, and, you know, somebody somewhere is doing something. And that's usually all it takes to, to get them to show up. And then that enthusiasm, they say, that's all it takes. That's got to light a fire in this pine forest. Yeah, man, light a fire. Uh, and a lot of times they'll pop up right after that. Well, I got a feeling we're going to have you all back and talk some more. Mm -hmm. it's, Absolutely. It's, just, it's been really interesting. So so we've got a couple of things left to do here. We're going to do an Ask Dudley. We, we're learning people really enjoy Hearing that, but before we do that, Mike, we've got a trivia question oh, that we okay. want to ask the both of you. So either one of y'all can speak up, um, and you can also ask Dudley, Lanny, or Bill as a to help you uh, with with this. So I, I would suggest Dudley. <laughs> so, yeah. so you can ask for some help, and we've got the question has got two clues. 
just so y'all know. And then you were playing for an uh, Mac. What are we playing for? We're playing for a game hide briar proof upland vest. It's Ooh. tough. It's durable. I mean, it's got front and rear loading blood proof game bag. I mean, it's got an orange game bag in the back for additional safety. I mean, it's it like a coil. It slices, it dices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. South Carolina gobbler. All this, is, Mark. It's on the line. Does Mark get a vest too? No, I think it goes to the guy we're playing for. Right? Mark does not get a vest. <laughs> Mark gets an Agri B measuring cup. Oh, we get one wow. out of here I'm for measuring that. it out as herbicides. So, uh, why don't, let's let's let uh, y'all concentrate now. No bot, not to put any pressure, but nobody's ever gotten one of these questions wrong. I can always blame Olivia. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a quote about quail. Who said this quote? Life is just too short to go quail hunting with the wrong people. The clues are he was a president from the southern part of the United States. I thought we got too close. Jimmy Carter. That's right. Wow. Right. I think Mark knew it before the before you I even think finished. He I, I, I he use was it. Worried. He was I use, mouthing the quote. He knew it. I use, I use that quote when I teach class on quail management. I, Boom. I, I start presentations with a picture of Jimmy Carter with the quail hunting with that quote on and to let to let people know no matter what we're learning, this is what we come back to. You know. I pictured in my mind Lyndon Johnson picking his dogs up by their ears <laughs> on national television, but those were rabbit dogs. Yeah, those were rabbit right. dogs. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah Jimmy Carter was a big, oh, big South South Jimmy Carter. Yeah, South Carolina. If you'll get in touch with us, we'll uh, we'll make sure that that game hide upland vest gets sent to you. So, Mark, this is the time of the, sh the show where it gets a little dicey. We hand the steering wheel over to Dudley, and he takes over for just a little while. So uh, this is the, called the Ask Dudley segment. Ah, nice. Okay, um, this is going to be a little bit different. So it's, it's, uh, it's not really in a listener's question, but uh, we were talking about your uh, putative national champion, sand hickory that we, we've decided it is a sand hickory oh is it the jury and, uh, and I, I was asking bobby you know uh, we, we were trying to decide if it was a pig nut or a sand and it was leafless at the time um it it sprung some leaves and uh somehow i was telling bobby like i i need some leaves and can you press them in a book and he was like well yeah maybe i can go shoot them out or something and i was like well you know you may find some on the ground just if you go from a windstorm or some twig girdlers or something. And uh, it just reminded me of when I was a kid and I found uh, a hickory branch on the ground and it looked like a dull but sharpened pencil on one end. And uh, I asked my granddad what it was and he said that that's from where a squirrel does a somersault on the branch up in the tree and chews while he's doing a <laughs> somersault and the branch falls to the ground and then he runs to the ground and, and eats the nuts off the branch. And uh, for a long time, <laughs> I, I thought that's what that was. And uh, then I, uh, I'm embarrassed to say that in my older age, I discovered in an entomology class that I was very wrong <laughs> and I never admitted that, but I'm, I'm admitting it to lots of people. Um, and so what it is, is it's an insect. It's a, a type of beetle uh, called a twig girdler. I'm not even going to attempt the scientific name, but uh, it looks kind of like a curculio weevil, but a lot larger. And that, that's, the, oh, yeah, yeah. that's the weevil that <laughs> leaves the larvae in, in, in the inside of acorns or like a plum seed or something like that. But it's a lot bigger. It's a, a horned uh beetle. Uh, and uh, anyway, it lays its eggs on the branch. Like not under the bark, just on the outside? Well, of it? it'll, it makes a little indentation right near like a leaf scar or yeah. a bud scar. Drops an egg uh, in there. Yeah. And uh, it's like a, you know, wood boring beetle. And then the, the eggs hatch uh, and the, the parent beetle chews a circular pattern oh, around the branch, the branch and it and it gets really close to breaking but usually doesn't so that uh, it's like a beaver cuts down a tree it'll still be attached in the middle but then they go and, and lay their eggs on that leaf scar and then the wind or whatever shakes it out 
and, and sometimes they'll actually go to the ground and lay their eggs like that, but then they hatch and the little bitty larva burrows into the stem and stays there and just eats the inside of the stem while it's laying on the ground. And then uh, fall hits and it, and it pupates. Uh -huh. And uh, again, it stays in there and it builds a little uh, thing on the end where uh, nothing can get in. Yeah. And, uh, and then it, Turns into a, and it a pops out and turns, yeah, and turns into a beetle and goes up and does it all does over it again. again. Hmm. <laughs> Interesting. I've seen those sticks a lot. I had never realized what's what it was. Thank you, Mister Know It All. So I see them too. Your awareness level has completely uh, changed. Yes. I, I always thought you it have was been squirrels. Advice. That's Jeopardy knowledge, right yeah, there. Some serious well, stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's some minute details that I wasn't perfect on. I'm, I'm far from He's an. He's got a great name. I'm far from an entomologist, oh, but, don't be but so all of this stuff kind of interests me. So he's girdling not just the bark and the, what's that called, the cambium? The cambium. There, but he's going all the way through the wood. So he wants the limb to break. Right. And it and it falls to the ground. Mm. Called a beaver beetle. Uh, a beaver beetle, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, oh for years, I thought it was a squirrel doing somersaults on the branch and chewing. And, of course, I never saw that. And I, <laughs> I don't know why I didn't. There we go. Good stuff. Well, so one thing that I ought to mention, because we've been working with a group called Quail Forever a little bit, and uh, I think they're really growing in strength and having banquets around. And so, guys, if you listen to this and there's a banquet, a Quail Forever banquet, it's something you ought to check out because I think they're getting stronger in the South, from what I understand. And uh, they seem like some really good folks that really care about quail, from what I can tell. And, look, you've had your young son, Mason, over here, and he's uh, – what a handsome young man he is. He looks just like his mother. He's very lucky in that. <laughs> well, uh, look, this has been a lot of fun. Lanny, you got anything to add? No, just, uh, you know, again, always amazed by how much I don't know, you know, and, and uh, learned a lot today by what they were saying. And, you know, got a, a, I've always – being a southerner, you know, the, the quail's always had a special – uh, place in my heart from all the generations before but i think you know hey we just got to get out there and do something about it you know help them out let's do our part and start doing more turkey management more quail management and uh let's keep the turkeys going and get the quail back yeah so uh, uh, mark olivia have y'all got anything else y'all want to add before we kick it off i just say you you mentioned quail forever so i feel it's fair to plug them i, I can't say enough good things about that organization I, i've trained some of their biologists in fact we we do a bob white boot camp for them uh, me and james martin at uga we, we train some of their new oncoming biologists and and i've worked with them a lot in a bunch of states done some trainings for them a lot in the east and and did presentations i have never met a disgruntled or unhappy quail forever employee and i can't say that for uh, any other a lot of other places that's just a fabulous organization that has got their head on straight about what the mission is and how to do it. And if you're out there and you've got an interest in working with landowners to get habitat on the ground, that is a tremendous place to go work. Sure. That's good. Mr. Bill, you got anything to add before we go? I think I've said about all I need to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, we I just, just hope the quail populations come back. That's yeah, right. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we have, but it's good to see you. Thank you for being here. And uh, Olivia, you're always uh, you, you're, we always impressed by what, what you're doing, and uh, we just wish you uh, the best success in whatever you go on to do uh, and when you graduate from Mississippi yeah. State. And Mark, thank you for being here. Thank Dr. you for the Mark invite. McConnell, you are the – Associate Professor of Upland Birds. Who even knew that a title like that existed? I love it. I love it. Yeah, yeah it's a great one. Yeah. Richie, we, we got the horns. Yeah, okay, Richie. back off the horns, Richie. <laughs> I'm, I meant to say I'm a little uh, uh, upset about the lack of uh, taxidermy quail in this room. But, well, uh, we got one somewhere. There's a, there's there's a, there's oh, you're hiding them under the table <laughs> yeah, there. Four. I see. Yeah, six or eight right there. Yeah, that's yeah, right. So. Look, thank y'all. Why don't you say goodbye, Dudley? Goodbye, Dudley. Get us out of here, Mac Mac. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Gamekeeper Podcast. And be sure to tune in again. Subscribe to Gamekeeper Farming for Wildlife magazine. And don't miss the Mossy Oak Properties Fistful of Dirt podcast with my good buddy, Ronnie Cuz Strickland. <laughs>